Hello. Hello and welcome to Friday's live show. That was kind of a nice start, wasn't it? A little bit soft, gentle. Nothing too uh, aggressive this time. I don't want to like brah, make loud, obnoxious noises right in your ear as soon as you tune in because that is really obnoxious. I, I, uh, when I play video games, because I play video games to win, I am going to grab a book while I'm uh, speaking into the mic. I play video games to win, meaning I get really passionate about them and I want to do awesome at them and I want to win. And so I, what inevitably ends up happening is I start looking up strategy videos and how do you do this and what's the best way to do that and how do you approach and all that stuff. And there was one guy who had really good quality videos, but he started every one of them by slapping his head and making a loud like whoosh. And then he'd be like, top of the morning to you. And then he'd start talking really quick. And I was like, wow, that's really obnoxious and makes me not want to watch your really good quality videos. And so I stopped watching them. So I'm trying to train myself not to be overly excited at the start. We ramp up to the excitement. We want a, a buttery smooth beginning is what we're aiming for. Can you guys hear me? Because sometimes I start these videos and then no one can hear what I'm saying. So if you're one of these two eyeballs that's showing right there, can you just be like, yeah, I can hear you. Don't worry. Um, I'm going to talk about this book that I just pulled off my shelf called coincidentally playing to win becoming the champion by David Serlin. This is a photo of him on the back. Hello, David Serlin. So uh, David Serlin is a guy who was a, I'm going to read what it says back here. It's part of the Street Fighter. Street Fighter is the, Street Fighter 2 is the genesis. Okay, great. Hey, Anna. Street Fighter 2 is the genesis of fighting games, of a format of video game, which is you versus another character, and you're fighting each other using typically martial arts. And, uh, well, that's all right, Anna. You can leave. Stay for this Street Fighter uh, explanation. Uh, you and another character fighting each other, you use martial arts. Usually your character can do super special moves like shoot a fireball, a Hadouken, or a Shoryuken, or you know, whatever. And you have to input controls on your joystick to make your character do what you want. And I have always thought, fighting games have always been one of my favorites for a few reasons. They require good technique. You need to be able to enter the right inputs at the right time. So you have to like develop some muscle memory. And then two, these games become very, um, very mental is what ends up happening because they start to become a little bit like an advanced game of rock, paper, scissors, where I know that if, if you jump at me, then I can use my, my uppercut, my sure you can to knock you out and you're not going to be able to do anything. So then, okay, you know that if, if I, if you jump at me, I'm going to knock you out of the air and I'm going to do damage and so on and so forth. So then your next thing is like, oh, how do I trick Adam into thinking in a jump? So he does his uppercut and then he's vulnerable in the air. So these games become very uh, mental and they became a lot like my experience playing squash. Uh, the game of squash, a racket sport, is played in this small little glass box if you've ever seen squash played. And the cool thing about squash is that the once you get to a level of fitness and a level of, of play, you can pretty much cover the court and get to any any shot. And so the game starts to become very cagey. You're trying to disguise your shots and you're, you're slowly but surely pushing your opponent further and further off of their game until you can eventually hit a winner and, and end the game. So anyhow, my favorite style of games, I got a little off topic there. Playing to Win is a fabulous book that David Serlin wrote about the mindset and what it takes to win in any, any particular game. And he talks about, um, you know, like the phases that people move through as they learn and become better, as well as like mindsets that get in people's way. And the um, the first one he's got here, I was just looking for this. You can see right there, introducing the scrub. The, so the scrub is the player in any game who loses and then gets mad at the person that beat them and says things like, ah, that was cheap what you did, or ah, you that's unskilled the way you played. So the scrub holds this kind of ideal in their mind, like there's a right way to play this game. And the reason I lost is because I was sticking to the noble or the right or the correct or the skill-based way of gaming, and this person did whatever. And what Serlin says in his book is um, that's in the way, assuming that what you want to do is play to win. So he's not saying it's wrong to hold that there's like a noble way to play the game. 
all he's saying is that that will give you a different result than actually playing with the mindset to win. And so he kind of, for me, a lot of this book was um, really early investigation into mindset and how our set of beliefs in any given moment will allow us to create some set of results, but not all of the results because every belief is inherently limiting. And so if the result you want is to win, you got to create the mindset of playing to win and then act from that place and so on and so forth. Really interesting book, not super thick, fairly small. I always recommend this to anyone that's, um, that's interested in uh, like competitive play of any sort of thing. And he does a lot of things. He talks about not just Street Fighter, but um, Magic the Gathering. He talks about uh, chess and a whole variety. We're going to pour some tea while we're talking about this. A whole variety of other uh, other games and their design. Oh, hello, Lady Megan Smith. Nice to have you with us. You and I are going to see the same person. I guess it'll be coincidentally meaning coincident with one another. I'm going to see OBS and then you'll see her afterwards. So well, there'll be a passing of the baton of the Michelle Aubrey baton later today. The other thing that is really cool, if you go to David Serlin's website, serlin.net, he talks a lot about game design and game the game theory, the theory of game design, which I find fascinating. And so he looks at board games, video games, um, more traditional games like chess or soccer or sports. And then he looks at like the stuff we wouldn't think about, the stuff that's kind of hidden from us or just transparent to us because we play the game. We don't think about how the game's been designed. When you're playing soccer, you don't think about what it is that makes that a compelling game or what makes it work or any of that sort of stuff. So his book and his writing, I find really compelling. Hey, Lana, nice to have you with us. Last thing. Uh, this is uh, something my friend Toku bought me for my birthday this year. This is Ryu or Ryu, or I, I always get their names wrong. He's a character in Street Fighter. He's meant to, you, I guess you put your controller in his hands. So there you go. The thing I like, first of all, Ryu's badass. That's a fierce, look at that fierce face. I can't even get my eyebrows to do that. And his eyebrow control, his eyebrow game's so good. Look, it goes up over his bandana. So that would take, that's really something. Anyhow, way to go, Ryu. You're a badass. I'll put you back over here. He sits there on my printer looking at me, encouraging me to be ferocious and to grow my eyebrows a little longer. I think if I didn't trim them, I could probably get to that level. I could probably do that. <clears throat> okay, well, I've prattled on about nonsense for a while. I've poured the tea. We got some stuff to talk about. I'm actually going to talk about one thing I'm really excited about right now that's super nerdy. So if you are of the nerdiness persuasion, this might interest you. I need to bring up a link. Let me just find this so I can share it with you. There it is. Uh, so the entry point for this nerd topic, and then we're going to get into leadership and coaching and all that stuff. We only have four people watching. I suspect people are like, Adam's going to talk about the bullshit first. Then he gets to the good stuff. That's when we want to show up. Bob, hello. And I did not get a square inch of Scotland. I seriously considered it. I looked at it. I was like, ooh, does this do anything? But I don't even think you get a deed or anything. So I don't I don't think it really I don't think it really works, which is very disappointing. But I did toy with the idea. And Megan, we're rocking some Pacific Sun right now, which is vanilla and orange black tea. Mm. So um the first thing I want to share about that I'm really um quite excited about, I don't know if excited is the right word, but I'm into, I'm exploring, is this thing called Zettelkasten. Here's the link to the Wikipedia page. And Zettelkasten is this notion of knowledge management. And the idea behind that is we, um, we don't have very good systems for organizing our knowledge. You know, we have all of this information in our brains and then you know, how do we store that? How do we how do we store it and how do we retrieve it? And what do we do for that? And so there's a lot of um, versions or attempts at this, like Evernote may be something you're familiar with, which is a system that um, allows you to store notes and capture clippings and web pages and images, and then you've got it all stored in your nice system. And what most of these systems do is they have us impose a hierarchy on our information. 
So what that means is if you want to store a piece of information, the first question you have to ask yourself is like, okay, what are, what's the category this fits in? And is there a subcategory below that? And then this, and then that, and then how does that all play out? Which is fine. And the reason we do that is because it allows us to retrieve it quickly. It, it helps us with our retrieval because we're like, oh, right. Where would I store my deed to my house? Well, it's probably in my documents category. And then below that, it's probably in like home stuff. And then below that, it's probably like important legal documents. Great. I found it there. So, you know, all of these systems are pretty, um, a lot of them we just know intuitively, like a library um, uh, catalog. That's a version of a knowledge management system. Zettel Kostin is something created by this Create, what's his name? I'm going to look it up. I got his webpage up here. Uh, he was named, this is the most famous one. Uh, ah, yes, Niklas Luhmann. Niklas Luhmann. So Niklas created a um, entirely paper system. And what he did was he created it such that he had all these paper index cards and he would sort of write the idea that he had and then tags, attributes, and that way he could reference all of these ideas, which sounds incredibly complicated and wieldy and like just a crazy amount of effort. But it's fascinating. If you look at his system in that link I just shared, you'll see like his his shoe boxes of index cards that he could reference back and forth. So what my friend CK Lin got me onto was this um, newer, it's about two years old system called Rome Research. I'm going to try to, let's see if I can just find you the link here. Rome Research, click, click there copy that, and then close this and put this in our comments. So what Rome does is it provides a way to do all of this stuff digitally for you. You don't have to manage index cards. You don't have to do any of that. And the, the beauty of the way Rome works is it doesn't require you to impose any kind of hierarchy before you start to capture your thoughts, meaning you just sit down and start typing whatever there is for you to type. And then as you do that, Rome naturally finds the links to the other stuff that you've typed. So you end up with this graph of information where you can be like, oh, this to that to that. OK, cool. What's really exciting to me about this is that um, the, the possibility it opens up is, let's say I have an idea about leadership and I start to write about leadership and I start to think like, oh, yeah, anger as well. And I start to write about that. What this system called Rome allows me to do is then very quickly say, show me all of the places where I've written about both anger and leadership. And then I can get this really comprehensive um, image or, or node or like sort of explanation of all of the intersection between leadership and anger that I've worked through. And from there, new ideas can emerge. So what it really makes um, possible and quite exciting is not just having an idea and storing it, because we can do that with any system. We can do that with books, right? Like this notebook right here has a ton of ideas in it. But most of the time I put my ideas in here, there's like a bunch of infographics, ideas, thoughts I've had, but I don't reference this ever again. And at no point do I sit down on my computer and start to write and then reference what I'm writing against this book. It goes in here and then it stays there until maybe I pick up the book out of curiosity and flip through it. What Rome allows for is that happens automatically. So everything that I put into that system now becomes referenced with every new piece that I put into that system. And so the way people describe this is like you kind of get compound interest. The more ideas you put into your system and capture, the more the links between them start to get made for you. And then you can very quickly be like, huh, today I might be able to say like, today I really want to write about power powerlessness and sadness. And then just quickly see like, what are the things I've written where both of those ideas have come up? So it's very exciting to me. I've been fiddling with that. That's been sort of one of the projects I've been taking on over the last three or four days, spending a lot of time in it. And um, it was fun. That's the sort of stuff I really like doing. So it's been a cool project to, to play around with. OK, well, that's enough about that. Let's uh, let's get on to the good stuff. So we've got some topics here. Uh, big thanks to Heather, Sarah. Well, I guess Sarah didn't provide a, a topic. She just thanked me for last week. But big thanks to Heather, David, Anna, and Karen for the topics you guys have brought. We're going to start with these, and then we'll see where they uh, where they lead us to. Low uh, low viewership today. I imagine people are probably out in the summer sun. Maybe. Yeah, check it out, America. It's a really fascinating, you know, uh, fascinating 
system. And I'm going to put one. Um, let me find the link that I was watching. 100 Rome tips. Ah, uh, yes, here's the video. So the other thing for anyone interested in Rome, I'm just going to get my fan on here. Here's a video that shows 100 tips for using it. The trouble is you start to watch that and you're like, I don't know what this means. But as you watch him use it, about seven minutes in, you're going to start to see the power that a system like this has and start to be like, oh, wow, I really understand now how fast these things can start to get connected and, and all of that stuff. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to follow it too far. Just watch what they're doing. And then over time, it's going to start to make a lot of sense. And you'll be like, ah, I can see the value in this. So slowly but surely, I'm migrating a lot of my note taking, all the notes for the live show, all the notes for my podcast, all of that I'm, I'm putting into Rome because it allows for so much more richness in what gets created out of it. I guess the way I would describe it is with Evernote, which is what I was using previous, the richness is contained in the four corners, the four, um, yeah, the four corners of that particular note. So if I write a podcast episode about something, all of the richness of that information is contained in the note that I've created. There's no real cross-referencing or anything like that. In Rome, the richness exists not only in the note that I initially create, but then every connection that, that expands outwards. So very quickly, it, it grows exponentially. It's, it's quite profound. My friend CK is talking about using this as a tool for um, a digital psychedelic experience is the way he described it, which I have no idea how he'll make happen, but I think that's a really cool concept too. Okay. So let's see, we'll start at the top, I think. Um, so Heather asks, define the difference between values and essence. So the anytime we do this, I have to start by caveating that these are just terms. And I'm going to use some definitions, but other people might define them differently. And so Oh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll come back to that, America. Um, well, I'll come to it right now. So America's asking, like, how how is it helpful for you to connect all the dots in a system like Rome? So America, one example would be over here, I'm writing about leadership. And then over here, I'm writing about anger. And then there may come, and let's say I've collected a whole bunch of thoughts in both of those areas. And there may be a point where I'm like, ah, I feel called to do a podcast or to write an essay on the relationship between leadership and anger. What Rome allows for is very quickly, I can see all of the intersection. I can see all the places where both of those concepts have been mentioned. And it'll show me, here's all the places where you've written about these two things. So I can capture that intersection very fast and then start to synthesize that information and so on and so forth. So it is the connectivity that, I mean, that's where all of this stuff lies, right? It's when you and I meet in this conversation right now that the richness occurs rather than just me saying something by myself or you saying something by yourself. So it's a system that really allows for networking of ideas. Okay, so um, values, essence, we have to start by defining these or, or loosely trying to do that because um, uh, hey, Aunt Andrea, happy, happy Friday. It is. It's really fascinating. Super interesting product. Um, so when people talk about values, let, well, let's start with essence, because I'm really clear on, on what I mean by that word. And the essence would be that which you always have been, always will be, until you move on. So it's the it's the core of who we are. It's that which exists below the level of our personality, our personality being however we've learned to be in whatever situation we currently find ourselves in. Oh, Adam's the guy that jokes even when it's inappropriate. It might be part of my personality. Oh, Adam's the guy that's super chatty at the networking event. It might be more of my personality. Um, Essence is whatever is below that. So it's a level beneath that. And at least in my lineage, we use essence to describe the set of um, the ways of being that someone brings into the world. So like what we would say here is that each human being resonates, brings particular qualities. And those qualities exist below the level of their personality. Their personality will take these qualities and mold them into particular shapes particular ways of showing up in each and every moment, but the qualities underneath are kind of there from the start. So 
Um, the, the easiest way to get at these or to look at these would be ways of being. What are the ways of being that we bring to the table? Brilliance, connection, compassion, love, right? Qualities of being would be our essence. And then you can imagine then like someone who's really brilliant, who feels um, uh, spurned or hurt by someone and then wants to retaliate, they're going to retaliate using the, the, the underlying qualities that they are innately. So a brilliant person, a person who, who embodies the essence of brilliance will probably retaliate with like really cutting remarks or undermining someone or making them feel stupid or condescension or really effectively arguing to prove why that person was really stupid for what they just said. Whereas someone who embodies the quality of love, someone who brings the being of love to the table will um, might get back at someone using um, like by either removing love so being quite cruel or by suffocating someone with love, I'll kill them with kindness. I'm going to be so nice to them. They're going to feel guilty about what a shithead they are. I'm just going to smile and make them pie and love up on them so hard. And so that what's happening there is our personality or our ego or our, our fear or whatever you want to call it is using the underlying qualities of our essence so as to affect a particular result. So essence lies beneath and at least in the lineage I'm trained in and that I work with, our essence is given by the set of qualities of being we embody innately. Um, personally, I don't always find a lot of, this would be a little uh, meta, I guess, but a lot of value in the conversation about values. Usually the way people relate to values is there's something external to themselves. They're like, they're kind of close to who they are, but they're not who they are. Um, and so in that instance, your values become like, I really value loyalty, which means that you place a high amount of value on loyalty, but it doesn't really tell us much about who you be in the world and doesn't really tell us much about um, what what is gonna be most, um, most uh, freeing for you to express yourself as. So typically values are something people kind of like the way I should be. Here is the good ways to be. Now, having said that, my experience is that the values people choose are often informed by the essence they are. So someone who is, like embodies love is really going to value gifts or compassion or thoughtfulness. All of these are kind of an expression of the quality of love. So Turns out as I'm speaking about this, I don't have a lot to say about it. Usually when I am sitting down with someone and they want to talk about their values, of course, I'm going to listen and, and get curious about that. But what I'm really listening to underneath is like, what is this conversation telling me about who this person is at their core? And then what I'm generally really curious about is where in their life are they not embodying what is innate for them? which is to say like, where are they showing up in a way that's incongruent with the essential nature that they are? So for someone who's love, where are they showing up as something other than love? What for, and what's the cost of that? What's the impact of that in their life? Um, if you guys listening have had any conversations, like I don't, I don't tend to have a lot of conversations with people about their values, not because I don't think that there's value there at all, but just because that, conversation tends to get almost um, almost a little bypassed because we're going to what I would assert is a, a deeper level of who they are. And so it's kind of like that conversation tends to just fall away. So for anyone that's listening, if you've had an experience of that kind of conversation, please share it in the comments so that we can, you know, then, then we can have a little richer conversation. So don't have that much to say about this particular topic, given that it's just not a conversation that I'm in that much. Okay, let's, let's move on to um, Anna asks, well, she says, I've been curious about being a stand, especially for potential clients possibilities. So let's talk about stand. What, what is stand? Because that's a often misunderstood concept and um, it gets stepped over and it's really crucial to a conversation about coaching and leadership. So Let's see, I'll have a sip of tea first. 
So, um, oh, America. Uh, America says, for me, values has been a way to use as a compass, but there's a difference between actual values and meaning with somebody would aspire to be, and I got a little lost in your typing here, America. There is a difference between actual values and uh, I think you're saying some meaning with somebody would aspire to be off and they get confused. I'm not totally clear. Uh, maybe you can just clarify a little bit what you're saying, America. And Andrea says, I really like the distinction of value versus essence and finding where you are incongruent with your essence. Yeah. I think like often when people talk about values, that's the really, we, we don't, we're not trained and further, we can't really see our essence. We can't see our being because it's just the water we exist in. So it's invisible to us. And at the same time, it surrounds us and is constantly around us. It's the thing that's always there. And that's how it works. That's how a blind spot works, by the way. It's not that it's invisible. It's that it's always there. And so you just pass right over it. Um, America says people, oh, great. People might aspire to be a certain way or have a certain value, but it's not actually what's going on in reality. Yeah. So I often find values become like, um, they become a, here's the metaphor, Enron, the company that famously was very corrupt and ultimately like manipulated energy prices so as to like make a profit and completely collapsed, huge issues. The CEO, I think, and one of the founders killed themselves, like terrible. Enron had the word integrity written on their wall as a value right up until the day that they fell. And so often that's what, like, again, we can ascribe any meaning we want to these words and then we can live into that meaning. So this doesn't mean value equals bad. I'm more um, kind of indicating the way I notice most people tend to relate to the concept of a value, which is like, it's something they put on their wall and then it becomes like an aspirational thing, but not so much something that they're really living into and living from. And so, um, and it becomes an external thing. Like I am the way I am and that over there is my value and I'm gonna step into that. And as we bring values closer and closer internally into like, oh, it's not a thing out there for you to, to try to become. This is who you've always been. And you've learned at some places in your life to show up different from that, to, to bend yourself into an alternative shape. Ah, if we can start to help you unfold into what's natural for you, your values kind of come about without a lot of effort. They, they're, they're already there. You don't have to figure out how to get over to some place that you aren't currently. You just have to learn how to return home. That's kind of, I guess that's the distinction I've got. Okay, so let's talk about stand. So um, how do we get into this? We're going to talk about stand. Then we're going to talk about um, what Anna's talking about here, which is like potential clients' possibilities or potential like the possibility we see for our direct reports as leaders. So um, there's two ways we tend to be with people when there's a result that they're up to creating in their lives. And both of these ways are not stand. I'm going to draw the spectrum, the default spectrum first. At one end, we're attached. So someone says, I really want to lose five pounds. Just make that up. And, um, and so from attachment, and this is really common when people get into coaching and don't really take on much training. They're attached to that particular result. And so from there, we, we will do things like call up the person every night. Like, Did you do the thing that you said you were going to do? Or we'll get annoyed with them when they don't do the thing that they said they were going to do. Or we'll um, we'll just get really frustrated or we'll, we'll sort of like make passive aggressive comments to kind of like, hey, you're meant to do that thing. Or So that's what attachment looks like. And almost all of us have had an experience of attachment from our parents, from our upbringing. Not because our parents were wrong, stupid, bad, didn't know what they were doing or should be shamed for any of this. It's because attachment's human. When we try to get someone to do something, we become attached to them creating that particular result. So that's the one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is we become resigned. So resigned is like the person says, hey, I wanna do this thing, can, can you help me? And we're like, yeah, sure, whatever, fuck it. 
go ahead, let's do it. And we might ask them like once, like, did you do the thing? And the person's like, no, I was just tired. And we're like, yeah, okay, you're always tired, whatever, it doesn't matter. So we, we kind of give up. We're resigned that it's not gonna make a difference, blah, 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 blah. So this is the, and then there's, there's a whole spectrum from one end to the other. And the trap is like to try to find the midpoint. But anytime I draw out a spectrum between two poles like this, the midpoint is an illusion. What we're really going for is a breakthrough that allows us to transcend these two poles. So attachment on one side, resignation on the other side. And neither of those are really very fun. On the one side, you're attached and you get anxiety, frustration, annoyance at the person not doing the stuff that they said they were going to do. And that becomes personal. You take it personally because you're attached to it. And they feel your energy and start to be like, ah, oh, they start to hide it from you. They don't want to share, blah, 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 blah. At the other end of the spectrum from the resignation, there's less friction because I just stop caring about you. Whatever, doesn't matter. In leadership and coaching, we strive to stand for someone. And when we're standing for someone, we are remaining committed whilst letting go of our attachment. So it's a bit of a both and. We, and, and the way this works is that the metaphor I often like is the idea of like you standing beside someone and you just hold your hand on their back. You don't push them forward because that's attachment, right? That's like me pushing you into doing the thing that you say you wanna do. And it's not that that won't work, but it's that now the cause of you creating what you say you want in your life is my hand pushing you forward. So I'm not doing that. That's not standing. Standing is my hand is right here on your back. You can feel it, the small of your back, you know, that little curvy part right there, warm, warm. That's a weird thing to say, hand on back. But I also don't take it away and say, fuck it. I'm going to go over here and do something. I leave my hand there. So my hand doesn't push you forward, but it also doesn't drop you. I don't, and that's what happens from resignation. From resignation, basically what unconsciously is happening is it's too painful. I can't be with my own desire for you to create this result and you not doing it. So both of these sides, attachment and resignation are both examples where the, the friend, parent, coach, leader, whatever, can't be with their own suffering that gets caused by the person they're trying to support not doing what they say they will do. And then they either try to remedy that suffering by shoving the person forward into it and making them do it, which will then alleviate their discomfort or saying, fuck it, I'm going to give up any, I'm going to stop caring whatsoever. So now I can stand behind you, but I just don't give a fuck. And from there, I don't have to feel any of the suffering because I've disengaged. I've emotionally withdrawn myself. So when we're standing, we're not doing either of those. We're just holding our hand right there with the person. And what that does is it, it has the person kind of, to some ex extent, continually face what they don't wanna face. So if the person says, I'm really committed to lose weight and I'm gonna do it every, every day, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z, and they don't, what most people do is they make themselves wrong when they're not doing the thing they wanna do and eventually they just give up on it. So giving up is like turning and walking backwards. You're turning and walking away. You can't do that when someone's standing, or at least you can't do it quite as easily because you have this hand on your back and that hand reminds you subtly of what you said you were gonna do. And it reminds you of like your commitment. So if you are gonna turn and walk away, there's that hand that you kind of have to, you yourself have to disengage from and you have to acknowledge on some level, there is a hand on my back that's standing for me because I said I was going to do something. So it doesn't, it doesn't make you wrong for what you've committed to and choosing out of it, but it forces you to be conscious of the fact that you made a commitment and you're choosing out of it. That's that feel of that hand. Can you guys just let me know if this is making sense? Some people in the comments just like, oh yeah, I'm following or I'm a little lost or whatever, just so that I know that we're walking this path together as opposed to just me blathering on about stuff. So that's the nature of stand is a hand on your back. So I'll give you some examples of this operationalized, like in real world. Um, 
One example would be some, like if I was working with someone and they said, I'm really committed to X, here's the steps I'm going to take. If we got on the phone and they immediately wanted to talk about the person in traffic that cut them off, I'm going to go, great, we can totally talk about that, but I just want to check in. You said you were committed to X, how's that going? And then they can tell me whatever they want. And all I'm going to do is ask them like questions like, great, is that going the way you want it to? Is there anything for us to take a look at? No? Okay, great. So that's the hand on the back. I'm not making them have a conversation. I'm not making them get into action, but I'm keeping them present. That's the way we hold people's feet to the fire as coaches. This requires a level of depth and ability to be with that most people are unwilling to develop because they want to help and fix other people rather than be in the more difficult conversation of taking a look on their own side. And so consequently, the conversation they get into with their clients, like you'll get coaches that are in conversations two hours, three hours long, or where they're like calling the person up three times a week and ostensibly in support of them. But what they're, what they're actually unable to see is they've become attached. They're no longer standing for someone. They're attached to that person doing the stuff that they want to do. So that's how we stand. That's what stand looks like. Let me come up with one more example, just so we've got it. Um, uh, in the forge, we have someone who, uh, good morning, Heather. Someone, we often have people come through, there's all different kinds of uh, personalities and shadows or survival mechanisms that show up. We get a variety of people all committed to their own transformation and breakthrough and a whole bunch of varieties of like shadow self-sabotage stuff shows up. One of the most common ones or one of the often common ones, uh, this is gonna be an example of standing, is people seeking an answer. So rather than generate, rather than trust that they have the answer, rather than trust and embody the brilliance and wisdom they are, they look to an expert, myself, Bay, or at other times, other people in the forge for the answer. Hey, what do I need to do? Can you tell me the answer? And in the forge, we're standing for people to more fully embody their essence, right? Like we were talking about earlier. And so in order to do that, like in theory, that sounds easy. Oh, I'm brilliant. I'll just trust that I'm brilliant. But you've built a whole life on top of the foundation of not trusting your brilliance in certain areas of your life. I promise you. And so to step beyond that requires some courage and some commitment. And it's an edgy thing to do. And it's not easy. In fact, we naturally have resistance and our ego is going to fight tooth and nail against that. So what happens almost every time, like every year we've run this, is that some of the people that are unable yet to fully trust and embody their brilliance and wisdom are looking to us for an answer, and we turn the question back to them. And the, the way the question tends to go is they'll be like, well, how do I do that? What do I do with this? And we'll say, great, what do you see to do? And their response will often be something like, I don't know, I can't think of anything. Right, so that's where they, that's where they end. They stop trusting themselves. Like, I don't know, and then there's no further thing. And so again, our stand is for them to embody their brilliance. So we'd invite them. Great, it's great that you're at. I don't know. Now we're going to invite you not to stop there. Take the next step. So even if you don't know, what might you do? What might be the thing to do? And then they tend to get quite frustrated because we're not giving them the answer that their ego, their shadow, is craving. Sort of like you know, if you have an itch and you really want to scratch it, and you don't. So that's what's going on for them. So it's creating some cognitive dissonance, some discomfort. So, ah, it's really frustrating. Will you give me an answer? And so our stand looks like that from resignation, we'd be like, fuck it, you're being annoying. That's us getting hooked by their being hooked. Fuck it, you're being annoying. Fine, here's the answer. We could do that. Or from attached, we could start to be like, we could start to get very... Um, unpleasant and and kind of hard with them and and the love could leave the space and we get really rigorous and pointed instead the work for us like the way our stand occurs is look i hear you asking for an answer and i'm willing to give you an answer i just want to make sure that's what you want because what i'm doing right now is standing for your breakthrough to embody and trust your own brilliance rather than come to me for mine so would you like an answer? So that's an example of stand, right? I'm not going to shove them 
into coming up with their own answer. I'm just going to make sure, God, I've got my hand on my back. I want to make sure that you're clear what I'm doing this for and, and if you really want me to take my hand off your back. So that's how stand plays out. So we've established what it means to stand for someone. Now, I want to talk about what Anna said, which is like, especially for potential clients' possibilities. So usually, my voice cracked there, that was fun. Usually people get attached rather than standing for something when they're with a potential client or a potential direct lead that they might work with or anything along those lines. Early coaches will get into a conversation with a potential client and the client will be like, oh my God, I can see this thing. And then that client gets scared because anytime you get present to what's possible in your life, you're also gonna get present to your fear. That's inevitable. That is a immutable law of the universe, if you like. It's an energetic law of the universe, which is that the amount of possibility, meaning the amount of life available to you that you're present to beyond what is predictable comes with an equal and opposite amount of fear. And the reason this is true is because if that fear wasn't there, this wouldn't really be possibility. You'd already be living into it. The fear is the reason this exists as a possibility rather than a predictability. So anytime you get present to possibility, like if you sat down with me and we started to talk about what might be available in your life, you're going to start to see some things that up until now you've written off. You've decided, I can't have that. That's crazy pipe dreams. That's not for me. I just need to learn how to be happy with the life that I have, right? That's a life about being okay with what's predictable. If you sit down with me or someone like me, a member of the forge, someone like that, you're going to start to get present to like all of this stuff in your life that previously you'd said you decided wasn't available. And then as you get present to that, the next thing you're going to get present to are all the reasons why you have not created that so far. Things like, ah, oh, but what if I fail? Ah, oh, but you know what? I might take a swing and I might look stupid. Ah, oh, but like things aren't that bad and I don't want to rock the boat. Ah, oh, like all of that shows up. So anytime we're in a conversation with a potential client and they start to see possibility, we have to remember that they're also going to get present to a bunch of fear. And what tends to happen is from their fear, they do what we do to alleviate our fear. So they might ghost, they might just stop talking to you. I've, I've got someone, it's the second time they've reached out to, to be in a conversation with me and then they've, they've gone silent. Not because they're stupid or cowardly or wrong, but just because there's a lot of possibility on the table and, and their fear is getting the better of them. It may not occur like that to them. It might occur like, I'm just really busy and now is not the time for this in my life. But again, right, that's one more reason why not step into your possibility. So what most coaches do, and certainly what I did early on, is hammer at them the possibility. Like, you, we think we're standing for something, but what we're actually doing is we're hammering at them, we're attached to the possibility we saw, and we're not really present to the fear that's, e that's equally showing up, and that they're kind of innocently in the throes of that fear. So to you, Anna, the first thing I would say is um, to really recognize the fear to like have a lot of space for the fear that is there so as to like hold that with reverence what most of us do is we're very um dismissive about fear like we think we can just kind of um uh what's a good way to describe it the metaphor I would use is it's kind of like when people people go swimming in Hawaii and and the lifeguards if you ever go are constantly like don't go too deep it's funny, they have megaphones the last time Bay and I were there and they're like, be careful of the, they're so bored. It's like the safari cruise at Disney. Be careful of the big waves. They will smack you around, break bones, not fun vacation. So what's happening is people don't have reverence for the power of the ocean. And then they go in and they're like, Wee! they surf the waves and then they get smashed against the sand because that ocean is a powerful motherfucker. And so too is our fear. So we don't hold a lot of reverence for their fear. We're quite dismissive. And we think like, oh, I just need to convince myself intellectually that I don't have anything to be afraid of. And then I'll do the thing. Your fear is much more powerful than that. And so we as coaches or leaders standing for someone's possibility, the first step is to really acknowledge the fear that's there. And then the way we stand for something different 
for them is with a lot of gentleness, a lot of love, and um, more often than not, a willingness to be unattached. From there, especially if someone's not yet a client or something like that, all there usually is to do is to just um, now and then reach out to them and check in and see how they're doing. There's not a lot more to do. What a lot of coaches do is they get attached to this client seeing their possibility and then it becomes it becomes obnoxious. And further, when someone hasn't yet hired you, it's not really your job to stand for them very powerfully. Just like it's not my job to stand for my friends. And it's often experienced as quite obnoxious if I try to do so for them. Like my job with my friends is to, to love them, to be in relationship with them and to at least the way I hold it, to work myself out so that I can come back to loving them however they're showing up without needing them to be any differently. That's that's my commitment there. If they say like, hey, I really want to do this thing. Can you support me? I'm usually very careful because we think we want our friends to stand for us, but we actually don't. We want them to kind of like stand for us until we feel like doing something different. And then we want them to go along with that, which is kind of called colluding. So that's typically more what we actually want from our friends. That's why um, your friend as coach, that that idea doesn't work. And it's why um, it's why I have a job. And it's why it's a big investment into coaching is because you're that's what has you actually choose into being stood for this particular way. Last thing I'm going to say on this is we don't really have much experience being stood for. The way we're trained and raised is one of those two poles on the spectrum or somewhere along the middle, either attachment or resignation, being made to do something because our parents were attached to us getting good grades or creating certain results or being seen as strong or, you know, whatever it happened to be. Or they just kind of got to the point where they gave up. And we're like, I can't make Adam, Susie, whoever do this thing. I'm going to just stop worrying about it. Thus concludes talking about stand. Let's see here. Uh, Karen's got some good ones. What did you write about, Karen? Karen says she'd like to hear. uh, Let's talk about encouraging discipline from a place of love versus whipping oneself. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on the value and role of motivation when it comes to consistency and discipline. Great. Good, good topics. Thanks for those, Karen. Um, so those of you watching, I'd love it if you'd share something. What are you taking from that conversation we just had? So I, I can calibrate like it's helpful for me. Hey, are we getting too technical? Are you are you getting something? What are you seeing for yourself or for someone else? Or what would you inception into someone else's brain based out of our conversation so far? I, share something like that. It's really helpful. Um, so Karen asked some, a really good question here, which is like, what are your thoughts on the role of motivation when it comes to consistency and discipline? I'm going to couch this a little bit differently. Instead of motivation, I'm going to talk about enrollment because that's, I believe typically when people talk about motivation, that's what they're really speaking to, but they don't understand it. Typically, when we talk about motivation, it's sort of like this weird nebulous idea that sometimes comes and lands inside of us. And then other times it just goes away and we're just not motivated. And and it's like it leaves us a bit at the effect. We're at the effect of whether or not we feel motivated to do something. And then from there, we get into all kinds of conversations like, well, I'm just not motivated to do this. So I guess that means I don't really want to do it. Okay, so I'm just not going to do it, which is totally fine. But there's not a lot of power and um, intentionality in that. And by power, I don't mean like force. I mean power like your ability to create what you say you're committed to creating in the world. America says, I think it was spot on, I think is what you're typing. I liked what you said about being attached when it's appropriate when it's not. And also the place about holding your hand on their back, not as a make wrong, but as a reminder of what they said they wanted. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks for sharing that, America. America. Um, so 
motivation bit of a tricky term. And it's also like, I need someone to motivate me, which again is problematic, right? That's the hand pushing you forward. Like what motivates you getting screamed at by my, not getting screamed at by my boss or uh, getting paid a whole bunch of money. These are extrinsic factors that tend to be, um, well, they're external to us. So as soon as the external motivator, quote unquote, leaves, our engine is out of gas. We kind of stop short again. So it's not the most powerful place to come from. So we're going to talk about enrollment instead. Enrollment is um, the thing that I am a yes to that has me take action. So I can be enrolled in my boss not yelling at me, right? Or I can be enrolled in um, getting paid. So just to go back to those two things, right? What I'm enrolled there is the thing driving me forward, the thing that has me be a yes to whatever there is for me to do is not getting yelled at by my boss or is getting this amount of money. Now, when those are what I'm enrolled in, I will do precisely what is required to get those and not a lot more. I, I was watching Office Space last night, movie from 1999, holy crap, with so many good movies in 1999, The Matrix, Fight Club, Office Space, tons. There's a bunch more too. Um, anyhow, so I was rewatching Office Space, still hilarious. And the main character comes in and he's talking to these efficiency management experts who are a couple of donkeys. And, um, and you know, everyone's kind of playing, uh, playing good. They're sort of like saying the right things to the efficiency management experts. And this guy's just been hypnotized to not care about anything. And so he's just speaking truth. And he says, you know, I got about eight bosses here at this company. And what that means is if I screw up, I got to hear about it from eight different people. But if I do something good and in a tech, this company gets more revenue, I don't, I don't see that anywhere. There's nothing that comes to me. And so what that means is I do just enough effort to not have to hear about bullshit from eight different bosses. So to bring that into our conversation, what that character's enrolled in is not getting shit from eight bosses. And when that's what we're enrolled in, we will do precisely what is required in order to gain that result. So what a lot of people do is get, they, they lead, they end up having their people enrolled in something like this. This happens in corporate settings. It happens in coaching conversations, happens everywhere. So now we can, now that we've got this notion of being enrolled in something, we can bring it back to consistency and discipline. A lot of what, uh, Andrea, yes, hell yes to office. I also watched Idiocracy the other day, which is also fantastic. Um, Andrea says the hand on the back feels like a conversation I've had around the rope. If I'm in a hole, I know that I'm the one that has to pull me out. But if someone can throw me the rope, in this case being the hand on the back, it can help ground me rather than just standing at the top of the hole and looking down. Yeah, that's the art of this, right? We don't want to, some people stand dispassionately and we need part of the cost of standing for someone is a willingness to feel, it's a willingness for me to feel whatever that means I feel. Like if I hold my hand on someone's back because I'm standing for them and they're confronted, they're gonna suffer in whatever way they suffer because they're unwilling to step into the confrontation. And if I stand next to them, I'm gonna feel that suffering too. Holding my hand on, my, on their back, they might even turn on and lash at the hand on their back, just lash out because that's what they know to do. That level of empathetic resonance is part of what it means to stand for someone rather than just to have my hand on your back, but then for me to like disconnect myself spiritually or emotionally from you so that you have the physical presence of this hand, but none of the warmth and love that we also require as humans. Okay, so coming back, we've got this notion of enrollment, consistency and discipline. So what a lot of people want in their lives is consistency and discipline. And if you ask them what, that, that's just, that's what they want. So if we look at that through the lens of what are they actually enrolled in, and we start to ask questions to explore that, what you find out is they're enrolled in doing the same thing over and over. 
not for any grand real reason. There's not like a bigger vision that they have. It's more like, well, I don't, I'm kind of lazy. I don't do this stuff that I should be doing. And so I want to develop consistency and discipline. So that's a really weak form of enrollment because what they're really enrolled in is like not being the way they are currently. You know, if, if it's like, let's imagine the reason that they want consistency and discipline is because they keep saying that they're going to go on a diet or they're going to lose weight and then they keep not doing it and they hate that about themselves. So what they're enrolled in really is not being the way they are right now. It's not that they're really enrolled in like, oh my God, I want to be able to go for a run. I want to be able to like go for hikes three times a week. I want to be able to go on a long bike ride and love that. I want, I have this vision of myself doing like playing sports and being really good. And that's what I'm craving. That's something to be enrolled in that's beyond consistency and discipline. Consistency and discipline typically is like how I am currently sucks. And I don't want to be that way. So that's what they're enrolled in. And consequently, when that's what we're enrolled in, we will do, we will be consistent and disciplined up to the point that we don't feel the pain of the way we are currently. So this is what you see with a lot of January, New Year's kind of resolutions or like just people sort of, I declare this is how I'm going to be. It's the end and it's time and I'm going to change and all of that stuff. They're enrolled in fixing the way they are they're enrolled in being not who they are currently and then they act until they no longer feel the pain of how they are currently at which point they don't keep doing it because they're not enrolled in anything beyond that so that's why our cycle of like growth tends to go like up and it kind of gets over this threshold and then it kind of falls back down until we start to feel the pain of it again and then we kind of get re-enrolled and like i suck and i don't want to suck and then we get back up and then we start to fall back down again. So that's what's going on. And consistency and discipline just become like the solutions to fix what we relate to is not okay about ourselves. I'm going to pause there because now we're going to broaden this out. Um, so it's worth saying, actually, at this point, anytime I have someone frustrated with their uh, when i'm working with like um leaders and they're frustrated with their team because their team keep doing the same things one of the things i'm curious about is like what are your team enrolled in and usually they're like what are you talking about first and then as we get close as we start to look at that it's it's really clear what they're enrolled in is not getting in trouble with the leader so then they're going to show up precise and, and there's like some other stuff, but by and large, their, their big enrollment is like, I don't want to get in trouble with this guy. It's kind of scary when I get in trouble with them. And so then they do whatever they need to do to stay in his good graces. And then they kind of do this. They bob up and down. Oh, I've got some good stuff in the bank. Uh Oh, uh Oh, uh Oh, okay. Now I got to do it. I got to try harder and so on and so forth. And so people kind of end up in this equilibrium. So that's our first part. The second part now we're going to talk about like enrollment as a leader and what that means. And the hard part here is that you're, whatever you're enrolled in, it's not static. It, you may get some support from a coach or you may sit down and do some work on your own and really get present to the vision of what's possible for you. Oh my God, I could like, have that that physique that I want and I could I'm just using weight loss whatever exercise well-being physical well-being as an example it doesn't need to be your thing you can choose anything at all it's just a common one it's just to be clear oh my god I could I've got that vision of that revenge body <laughs> that's the thing revenge body and hot girl summer and whatever that stuff is that's what I'm really committed to so you get really enrolled in something beyond just being consistent and having discipline and then what's going to happen is you're going to start to take action and you might actually start to put some discipline into place, not for the sake of discipline, but for the sake of the vision of possibility that you have for yourself. And then sure enough, over time, you're going to get confronted by whatever it is that confronts you typically that has you not attain this result. What that means is that there's a reason you don't already have this result. 
And the reason you don't already have this result is because there's some stuff that shows up in your life that confronts you. So for me, when it comes to like my habits around eating and stuff like that, what tends to confront me is that I can do stuff pretty good for a couple of months. And then the novelty of like eating right or drinking right or, you know, whatever starts to wear off. And then as the novelty starts to wear off, the other thing that's present is I start to get bored and things start to feel kind of mundane and it's no longer sexy that I'm trying this new thing out. I can't brag about it to everyone. Oh, I'm now doing this new cool, I don't know, medieval fasting routine or whatever. You eat like a surf. <laughs> so that all wears off. And then my desire and craving for novelty becomes more powerful than what I'm enrolled in. My enrollment, the possibility I'm holding starts to wane. So this is the point. Let's just give you one more example. So we have something a little bigger. When Gandhi sought, what Gandhi was enrolled in and enrolled millions of people in, in India was the British leaving India, leaving their occupation of India through India's peaceful resistance. That was what he was enrolled in. That was the vision he was enrolled in. And as they did that, it, it's really worth watching the Gandhi, um, I guess you'd call it a biopic starring uh, Ben Kingsley. It's a brilliant movie. It's really, really great. And um, one of the scenes you see is that the Brit Britain has shut down the salt mines or refineries or whatever it is, because that was a big export of India. Britain's closed that and the Indians line up. They set up like a, a first aid stand and then they line up and they walk up so as to go into the mine and then the British hit them with batons and they fall over and then India, like other Indians, grab them and bring them over to the first aid to heal them. And that, that just keeps happening. So the Indians, the Indians are not doing anything violent. They're not attacking these guards. They're simply trying to go to work and the British are beating them. Imperialism, blah, blah, blah. We can talk a lot about this. That's not the conversation we're here to have right now. The point is, imagine seeing these casualties. Imagine Gandhi like doing everything he's doing. And then in addition to that, hearing people complain about how it's not working, seeing people get hurt, seeing the impact of all of this, that's going to start to make it harder and harder and harder for him to hold on to his vision. So the natural, there's a natural entropy to our enrollment. What that means is that no matter how inspired you are by your possibility, over time, it's going to fade for you. That's inevitable. And what happens as it starts to fade is we make that meaningful. We make it mean something. And the stuff that we make it mean is like, oh, I don't feel, again, we, we shift into this idea about motivation. I don't feel motivated to do this. And from not feeling motivated, we just, we start to get like a little bit head up our assy. Is that a term? I feel like that's a term. We get head up our assy. We start to get a little, um, metaphysical or masturbatory or whatever you want to call it. We get very rational and analytical and and get into conversations like, oh, I'm not motivated. I wonder why not. So we try to figure out why not. And then where that line of thinking tends to lead us to is, I guess I just don't want this enough, or I guess I just don't really care about this, or I guess this just isn't for me, or you know what? I just need to wait, blah, blah, blah. So what happens is as our enrollment naturally fades, we make it mean something, and then we we use that meaning to kind of go back to what is easiest. As your enrollment fades, what's easiest is a return to your status quo. So if you're trying to lose that weight, you come up against this, you get really enrolled, you're inspired, oh my God, this is awesome, and then it starts to fade because it's no longer novel or sexy or fun, and people are no longer interested in hearing about your fast on Facebook and blah, 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 blah. Oh, I don't know. What does it mean that I'm not enrolled? What does it mean that I'm no longer motivated? The thing your body, the thing your, your sort of resting state wants to pull you back to is the status quo before. And so all of that thinking naturally provides a greased slide back down to the way things used to be. I guess I just need to wait for more motivation. Totally fine. Nothing wrong with doing this. But what's worth noting is that it just ensures that the cycle continues like we talked about. What the leader does is they they don't make their loss of enrollment mean anything. Just like if I was walking and a branch fell off a tree and hit me on the shoulder, 
I wouldn't make that mean, oh, I guess I'm not meant to walk. I mean, I could, I could fabricate that or I could say spirit speaking to me or whatever. But like for the most part, I wouldn't do that. I would be like, ah, fuck you tree. And then I'd keep walking. Be like, ah, that was just a weird random occurrence. It's just nature being nature. Gravity pulled the branch down. Doesn't mean anything other than what I choose to make it mean. And so the leader relates to their waning enrollment through that same lens. Oh, it doesn't mean anything other than the fact that my enrollment is waning. And if I'm going to keep going forward, if I'm going to keep foraging my path and creating some kind of new possibility beyond my status quo, what is called for is I need to re-enroll myself. So I need to sit down. I need to like, maybe I need to like take a look at what I'm holding on to that hasn't worked. Maybe I need to look at some anger or some emotions I'm kind of wrapped around and not willing to let go of. Maybe I need to do some work to let the past be put into the past rather than it being something I'm hanging on to resentfully. Maybe I need to get re-presence to what's possible. Maybe I need to talk to some people again. Maybe I need to do that. Maybe I need to just remind myself, whatever it is. But the point here is that the leader does not make it significant or meaningful that their enrollment has waned. What they do is just acknowledge that that has happened and then do what is necessary to get back to a place of being enrolled in the possibility they saw originally. And that is how, like from our enrollment, comes the willingness to get back into our consistency and our discipline and all of that sort of stuff. So it's ironic because a lot of people put consistency and discipline, they don't even look at enrollment at all. They just make consistency and discipline the goal. And that never really works because being consistent, being disciplined in a vacuum is like, it's not very enrolling. You know, like there is a reason you want those things. It's not just to be a consistent, disciplined person. And if you look at like people that come out of the womb, like children, they don't care about that. <laughs> we learn as an adult that we that that enables certain things, but we start to lose sight of our dreams and our visions. And then we just put our attention on what we need to do, how we need to be different. And that has the whole system kind of fall apart. So to Karen's question, like what's the role of motivation when it comes to consistency and discipline? It's everything. It's our willingness to get enrolled in some possibility. And then when that starts to wane, to re-enroll ourselves, to acknowledge it. Oh, I've lost my enrollment. Right now, I'm, what I'm enrolled in is that everyone sucks and I hate them. Okay, how do we get re-enrolled? When Bay and I first launched the intensive, we were doing a lot of, um, a lot of reaching out to people and inviting them. And we were trying to create something new. And, you know, it was hard to get people to, it's not, it's not a, just a, an easy yes for people to be like, I'm going to pay for a hotel. I'm going to travel across the world. I'm going to come to Victoria and I'm going to sit and do deep transformational work with you. That's not an easy thing to get people enrolled in. And so <clears throat> we were in a lot of conversations with people and a lot of people were no's. And over time, the possibility we were enrolled in started to wane because all of those no's were like, you know, our natural human selves were getting stung every time not because they were doing anything wrong or they should have been there, but because we're human and we care about what we're doing. So people would be like a no and be like, fuck you. They'd be like a no and be like, pearls before swine. You know, our arrogance would show up. And we had to do a lot of work to get complete, to like move the past into the past instead of holding on to it. So that then we could remind ourselves why we were doing this, what we were committed to in the transformational space and continue to invite people into that possibility, regardless of whether or not they were a yes to it. And, um, and so that's, that's what it takes. And a lot of people, in my experience, want inspiration to be magical for them. They want to just get inspiration to hit them in the back of the head. They're inspired, they'll do the thing, and they don't want it to ever wane, which is a lovely fantasy, but that's not how it works. You know, it, it just isn't. And so these people can often get quite frustrated and resistant to like re-enrolling themselves. And consequently, their their um, ability to create looks like a sawtooth wave. They get inspired and they create and then they it just drops off. And they get inspired to create the next thing and then it drops off. And they get inspired to create the next thing and it drops off. And that's okay. You know, you can create a fine life from this tendency, but there's stuff you know, beyond the limit of that particular sawtooth wave that they'll never be able to create. 
And what ends up happening when people are unwilling to tackle this is they end up getting into kind of, uh, well, they get resigned. The stuff beyond the point at which they stop, they just learn to say, I think I just need to be okay with the fact that I'm not going to get that. And then rather than that be like this beautiful ability to be present to life as it is and to strive for what's next, it just becomes a resignation. And then they become empowered in that resignation. So it's sort of like, this is as good as life can get. How can I be as happy as possible inside of that? That's where they end up. Andrea says, thank you for this distinction. There's a lot of consistency is king languaging going on right now. And if you aren't consistent, you're somehow a lame asshole who can't control yourself. So little reverence for ourselves in that, isn't there? Like one of the things I, I guess I, I don't want to say I teach people because that's not what I'm about. It's more that um, through my holding people with reverence, they learn to hold themselves with reverence. It's not that I'm teaching it. It's that they, um, they be with someone being this way. And that being kind of transfers not from a teaching, but from an, like almost an os osmosis kind of thing. And so that sort of thing, right? Like when people first come on they're like, oh, I want to be consistent. And, and we start to look at it. The first instinct they have is I'm just lazy. And I've always been that way. No, you're not. You're not. You're really not. There's a reason that you've created all of this. And the first step is to learn how to hold the way you're showing up now with a lot of reverence. And if we can start to do that, first of all, it provides a lot of room for spirit to show up, which is a beautiful bonus. But also it, it allows you to start to have a lot more love for you exactly the way you are. And that allows you to start to unfold into who you are here to be. Yeah, consistency is king. Grit was another word. I, I I haven't heard that so much this year, but like last year, grit was a really big one, which was like the willingness to keep going even when it's tough. And you know, you can hear in all these convert these um distinctions that they're like it makes the journey about the it, it takes the journey out of the possibility of their destination or where you really want to be or what your heart is inspired by, and it makes it about the thing right here. The, the other way I see this show up from time to time is um, people get really engaged, like really um, excited about challenges or practices, which are cool in their own right. So like someone will be like 30 day practice. I'm going to take a cold shower every day. Awesome. Uh, you did miss your topic, Hannah. You'll have to watch it in replay. 30 day practice. I'm going to take a cold shower every day. Great. What for? And if you ask them that, they get stuck because the place they're looking is, well, like it's going to taking a cold shower is uncomfortable. It's going to train my, so they start with the practice and then they try to um, build the vision from starting with the practice rather than starting with the vision and then building the practice that would support it. And it's all fine and good. It's just that when you start with the practice and then try to build the vision, your vision's inevitably going to be a bit hampered because it's <laughs> it's created from this initial place. Why do you want consistency? Well, okay, if I was, uh, you know, they're trying to build out this vision from, I need to be more consistent. This is not the most inspired place. <clears throat> Heather, I agree totally. My growth has been from being, working with, observing, and being open. Yes. Ma'am, indeed. Ah, uh, yes, Andrea, resilience is really popular right now, isn't it? The new grit. Resilience is an interesting one to me because um, I have a wife who's very resilient and a lot of, I tend to, um, I guess I would say I'm fairly resilient in a different way. And what in my experience I notice happens with resilience is Resilience occurs to me often like um, like every muscle clenched, like hit me, like I can take it. And the people that I find most resilient are often the ones most prone to suffering because from resilience, it becomes very challenging to surrender. It becomes very challenging to shatter into pieces. A resilient heart is very well suited to resist and remain resilient in the face of heartbreak. 
And that gets in the way of a level of depth that can only be reached from a willingness to just be shattered and devastated and then to deepen from there. So resilience is like this amazing human capacity to like come through unchanged or unscathed or to get back to where we were before through great trauma and challenge. And that is not a bad thing. Like I wanna be really clear about that, right? It's, it's really important, especially in the face of trauma. But the trouble then is like tr it, that is in a way at odds with transformation, right? Because transformation is ultimately death. It's a willingness for us to go into the cocoon and to be rendered into a bag of goo before we can take shape as whatever is next. So resilience is like this funny thing where it's held in high, it's held lofty and in high regard as it should be. Right. It's not like resilience, bad transformation, good resilience is very important because it allows us to get through trauma. It allows us to get through stuff that might not so much shatter us transformationally, but like shatter us to the point where we can no longer function. That's not the that's not the aim of, you know, if a cocoon just turned the caterpillar into goo and then it fell on the floor, ah, that's that's not very good. But there is a, a season for resilience and then there's a season for transformation. And the more someone has had to rely on resilience and getting through whatever there was to get through so as to return to the way they always were or to get through it unchanged, the more they've had to rely on that, the harder it is for them to embrace transformation because it's harder for them to surrender because they've been trained that surrendering equals death, not ego death, but death, death. And so that's that becomes very, uh, very challenging, very challenging for people. <laughs> Heather, Heather's just saying, I have so often criticized myself for not following through, not being consistent. And I know I am a super committed and driven human. So it has been confusing when I don't follow through. Yeah. And, and there's always a great reason for it, right, Heather? Like people, um, procrastination, this stuff tends to go in waves. Like my clients will, and probably your clients or your direct reports or whatever, tends to be like, now the problem they're all struggling with is procrastination and then this, and then this. Um, about four years back, procrastination was like the thing everyone seemed to be showing up with. And it was related to like, procrastination was a problem about them that they needed to fix. And so we just needed to figure out the right system to fix the problem about them. But that totally disregards their wholeness. And it totally disregards like, no, procrastination is a really cleverly designed system to have you avoid something. So what do you think would have you avoid? Like, we want to get below the level of procrastination equals bad to like, huh, your brilliance, your genius is avoiding this for some particular reason. If we can start to get to that, now we can start to really, now we can do some really good work. We can start to uncover it, get into it, open it up, transform the story that would have you avoid in the first place. And then all that work to fix procrastination, it just, why would we bother doing that? Because it was never the problem in the first place. That's where so much work gets, um, so much effort gets spent and it's a waste. Like, because what it's doing is solving the problem that never really was the problem in the first place. And that just has us go in circles. It's satisfying though. It's very satisfying. Um, what was your, oh yeah, Heather, if, if you have anything, we, we talked a little bit about values versus, um, essence, but I didn't have, I'd love to hear your definition of values. Cause I kind of worked with mine and, and ultimately didn't have too many places to go with it. So if you have something more beyond there, I'd love to hear it. Um, okay. To finish up on what Karen's topic was, the la the second part, or the, really the first, she said was encouraging discipline from a place of love versus whipping oneself. So what we'll tie this in, like what most people try to do is I'm not doing the thing I say I want to do. That sucks. And I hate that about myself. And then try to, they layer discipline over top of that. So now you have a solution that's ultimately growing out of self-loathing. So that solution is never going to, it, it, it can never really be very effective because 
any solution that comes out of self-hate is going to perpetuate self-hate. This is kind of the same dynamic that if, um, mm, I'm not sure that this metaphor is going to translate. So maybe I'll, I'll park that for a sec, but, um, before we can come up with like a solution, we have to really kind of be okay with where we are exactly as we are. This is the same sort of thing that happens when people feel imprisoned in their office job. And so the solution they create is I'm going to do the four hour work week. They, I'm going to spend every day on a beach, but because they're changing their circumstances, they're changing the stuff on the top, the surface, rather than address this, this experience of feeling trapped that exists within, they're just going to bring that same experience with them to the beach. And that happens all the time. You can, if you, if you read about it, you can find a lot of um, CEOs and entrepreneurs who have, they did the dream, they created the four hour work week, and then they were bored and they found themselves checking email constantly and they hated it and blah, 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 blah. And I can speak from experience in this because when we first started wanting to take time off June and December off every year, we created the circumstances first, we created that time off. And then I started to go crazy because I didn't, I hadn't yet created the ontological, the being of being off. I needed to get more support and do more work so I could actually have an experience of being off an, an actual experience of freedom. So anytime we're trying to create discipline from not loving ourselves, it's, it's going to be problematic. And so the starting point for this is when people are like, I need more discipline, really, it's hard to get to this by yourself. But the question for people to be in is like, what am I unwilling to bring love to right now? What aspect about myself is there for me to be with? And if we can start to be with that part of ourselves, meaning we don't need it to change, meaning we, we sort of embrace it as part of our wholeness, and we bring reverence and love to it. And we're like, ah, oh, there's a part of me that really likes drinking booze. Huh. What, what does that part of me need? What is that part of me there telling me? What is that part of me like calling out for? You know, these sort of questions. So that instead of fixing it and moving straight away from it, we can actually settle into it and sit with it and let ourselves be the way we're showing up. And from there... Any solution you create is going to be, it's going to be um, just a lot deeper. One of the ways this kind of happens is that when people have cognitive dis, this happens a lot with um, new clients and with coaches. Um, when people have, when they're confronted with their blind spots. So as an example, maybe someone um, is like, oh, I hate when people are judgmental. I can't stand it. Stupid judgmental people, blah, 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 blah. And then maybe I, being their coach in this moment, I'm just like, yeah, well, what I notice is you're incredibly judgmental. And they're like, what? I would never, no, no, I hate judgment. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's why you can't see that you judge the hell out of people for judging other people and you're rife with judgment. You just can't own it. And that's going to be really uncomfortable because their sense of self currently is I don't judge people and judgment is wrong. And now there's this new idea that's been obnoxiously put in front of them by me. That is you judge people. So now they have conflicting energetic ideas. They've got, I hate judgment. I don't judge people. Judging people is wrong. And I judge people. So there's going to be dissonance and dissonance inevitably creates discomfort. And then what people try to do from that is they jump to solving this so that they can alleviate their discomfort. So they'll be like, they'll craft some kind of solution. Oh my God, I've totally solved it. I, I'm not judging anymore. Now I'm blah, 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 blah. And what they're doing is they're just leaping away from that discomfort. They're, leap, they're jumping straight to, I figured out how to not judge people. Ah, oh, I'm so, and, and once again, they've gotten themselves off of being able to sit with the very thing they don't want to sit with. And if they could actually, <laughs> I'm actually not Heather, but I love that you said that. I, I didn't even, it didn't even um, come to me, but if we can, but you do have some experience with this. I know it. And if we can just sit in like, Oh, all right. I'm a judgmental person. And like, let ourselves be with all of the emotions that kicks up and everything that arises. 
then we can take a breath, then we can start to expand. And from there, maybe a different solution is going to arise. But what I can tell you is that you are going to be able to act with a lot more consciousness than if you're sort of like bing and jumping straight off. And I would assert that what we're describing here is the heart of the problems of all of like the polarization that we see. And hey, Maria, nice to, nice to have you with us. That we see in like political conversations and the way the world is increasingly going further away is that people are more and more judging someone over there for the way they're showing up and unable and unwilling to see how they themselves do that. And I'm not saying that that means we need to condone whatever we see over there. I'm saying that before we can, before we can ever really craft any kind of solution that would move us forward collectively, we got to be able to see this stuff within. Once we can see this within and be with it, then we have space to create something different. Then we have space to actually start to build from a place not of fixing what's wrong, but of like embodying and embracing our wholeness so we can move beyond that. And that's where the real magic happens. Um, a lot of, one of the things that's really interesting is a lot of people initially get into a leadership or a coaching conversation to fix what's not working about themselves and with great resistance to starting to see their own wholeness. And then as they start to see their own wholeness, it's almost like who they can be in the world expands and what they can be with expands. And it's really funny because they start to get reviews at work. They start to, I, I have a client who um, the, the pattern he used to have is he was really afraid of not being understood. So you get into conversation, he was brilliant. He is brilliant. You get into conversation with him and it was like, um, you know, uh, in boxing, the speed bags where they go like this and it goes hada, 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 hada. It was like <laughs> he was speaking at you that way. That was the impact. He, like it was speed bagging your brain. And um, what he was trying to do was he kept seeing new ways as he was speaking that he might not be clear. And then he'd insert more speaking to ensure that that was clear as well. And then that would lead to another place where he might not be clear and blow so on and so forth. And so he wanted solutions to get better at making sure he was clear. But the real work was him being okay with not being clear and everything that drove up for him. It drove up stuff like they might think I'm stupid. They might think I don't have the answer. They might think I'm not the leader I'm here to be. Uh, and as he started to be able to just be like willing to embrace the fact that sometimes he's not clear, everything changed. And needing to prove that he was clear stopped being an issue because now he could just look at people and instead of getting scared by it, be like, oh, I don't think I'm being clear. Are you following? And people would be like, they'd be like, oh, great. Where did I lose you? And everything shifted from there. People had more space. People could breathe more in his presence. He could breathe more in his presence. His thinking slowed down. His speaking slowed down. It's remarkable. And so it's super cool, right? It's not that we're trying to layer something on top, which is what a lot of people think this transformational work is about. It's that we're supporting your ability, developing your ability to allow more of life, more of life with you in it. And, and where that leaves you is ultimately on this journey that I'm going to now refer to as spiritual, your life ultimately becomes about life unfolding as you which is so cool and so neat and so effortless. Okay. Uh, I think the last one we've got here is uh, what David brought, and then we're going to wind down. Um, Heather's saying, I've embraced my judgmental self. Love that about you, Heather. And um, Heather says, I saw my judgment as something wrong, bad and something I should not do. That's a really popular one, isn't it? You know, it's wrong for me to judge. And you can hear it in people speaking where um, I, I don't like to have rules. I'm usually focused on being with someone. But when I talk to people and they're like, I don't want to be judgmental, judgmental, but I don't want to be judgmental, but I don't want to judge. But often the first thing that sets them free is like, 
okay, you don't want to be judgmental, but if you were allowed to be judgmental, what would you have to say? And that's like, the, it's so funny what happens. Not funny like they're stupid, just neat. It's neat to, to be with. Then it's like, finally, they have permission in a way they've never given themselves permission. So if we can just give ourselves permission for this stuff, it's amazing. It's like a 10-pound weight gets lifted off our back each time. We're like, oh, that's cool. Cool. I'm just allowed to be judgmental. Hell yeah. Doesn't mean you're going to act on it. Doesn't mean you're going to go up to the person across from the street dressed in a way that you think is stupid and be like, I think you look stupid. I'm judgmental. I feel great. We don't spray it on people, but we allow ourselves to be the way we are so that then we can actually be responsible for the way we are. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd imagine, Heather, that the people you work with are getting some of that gift too, both from who you can be with them now, as well as who they can be with. On this note, one of the first things I work on with leaders is them discovering and being willing to hear the voice of their judgment. We don't stop there because otherwise then what happens is they're just spraying judgment on people and that's not really responsible. But your ability to experience the place where someone is incongruent with who they are, the, the compass needle for that is your judgment. What you judge other people for is typically when you when you unconsciously experience incongruence with who they naturally are. If you notice someone over there who's like being loving on top of loving and you find it sickening, that what you're noticing is unconsciously, it's sort of like a, a note being played on the piano where it's turned up too far. It's like sharp or flat, whichever you like. So you're like, ah. That's obnoxious. Just like when you hear a song, if you kept hearing the same song and a note kept being flat or sharp, it, it grates on us, right? It, it, there's something off and we can hear it. We don't think about it. So that's what you're picking up over there. And just like a tuning fork best allows you to determine the note that it's tuned to as being sharp or flat, you yourself are a tuning fork for people that have the same qualities of being as you. So you're going to be particularly judgmental of the people that embody the same qualities as you, but are sharp or flat because you're sharp or flat as well, because you're a human. And so often with leaders, we have to start by like having them able to own their judgment first. And then we start to work with that judgment so we can take the judgments composed of two things. It's composed of something's incongruent and it's wrong. And then they're wrapped up like this. And so what we have to do first is have the leader here and able to actually own that they've got judgment. Then we start to pull these apart and have them set down and it's wrong so that then they can be like, oh, something's off. Then they can find their way back to love and then offer that like a gift to their report. Without it being something wrong over there, they can give it to them like, hey, who I know you to be is love, but it seems like you're trying to like really make an effort to like prove that you're love. And, and, you know, I'm curious about that. You know, what's going on for you? That's where masterful leadership can grow, but it's funny because it all starts with like a willingness to own our own judgment. Okay. So uh, let's see what David brought for us. Talk about increasing our creativity or different ways in making our art and taking action towards our visions. Always with the broad questions. David likes to give me like these broad ways to increase our creativity. Okay, let me think of how I increase my creativity. Here's the first one that I notice works for me. Um, lower bandwidth input or lower bandwidth in general. So this is higher bandwidth than if we were talking on the phone. So if we were doing this on Clubhouse, that's a lower level of bandwidth. Um, reading a book is a lower level of bandwidth from watching a YouTube video. Um, going for a walk without headphones, not listening to a podcast is a lower level of bandwidth from going for a walk with headphones in and meditating is a very low level of bandwidth. All you really have are your thoughts. So as a general, like place to increase creativity, one of the things I find really helpful for me is lowering my bandwidth. If, I, um, if I'm like, oh, I really wanna get into a creative state, then I sit down and turn off any um, 
Oh, here's another um, interesting distinction is I believe, and I don't know if I'm right about this, but my experience is that music without lyrics is a lower level of bandwidth than music with lyrics, which is a lower level of bandwidth than a podcast. So um, voice is more bandwidth intensive than music. I don't know if that's actually true, but that's my experience. So all that to say, if I want to get into like a creative mindset, Andrea, you may have some stuff to say about this too, because I know this is kind of your jam and you've been doing coloring and I remember you leading adult coloring at WDS. Remember when we went to WDS together? Ah, soon. Um, but I, I like to lower my bandwidth first and foremost. And so I actually have, a, there's this desk, which has a computer screen and an iPhone screen and like lights and pens and stuff on it and a keyboard. And then there's another desk over here. I'll just show you. That's my low bandwidth desk. So that desk has uh, pretty minimal uh, bandwidth stuff. Right now it just has books. So there's no, um, there's no digital devices there. There's just stuff that is pleasing to my eye and um, inspires creativity. So sometimes if I want to like get into a creative state, I'll sit down and I'll, um, I'll just, be with low bandwidth and i usually like to have a notepad and a pen so that i can scrawl ideas out um i haven't done it lately but there was a period maybe about four years ago where i was doing a ton of mind mapping not for any reason other than doing it and i would do it with um uh i had a someone had given me a set of colored uh, pencil crayons like an art kit and so I would just like start with some idea, some word, and then I would draw connections and kind of map it out and make it look pretty and put in some graffiti kind of stylings and stuff like that. So these are all ways to create like kind of opportunities and moments for me for creativity. Um, what else do I do these days? Uh, every morning is really devoted to like the first thing I do in the morning is meditate, make tea, I like the ritual of making tea and then sit at my computer with an empty uh, page to write on. And I write for about an hour and a half. Usually it varies. Some days it's half hour. Some days it's an hour and a half. And so, um, and what I do is I just write whatever is there to write. And if I can't think of something to write, I write nonsense. So that's one of the ways that kind of inspires my creativity. Uh, I'm going to read what you have put there, Andrea and Heather in just a sec. Uh, what else? I usually like any time I want to, um, like often what happens I notice is if I'm not putting podcasts into my ears and to be clear, I love podcasts. I listen to a ton of them. Um, but when I'm listening to music, that's usually when ideas come forward. And then once I have that idea and if I want to do something with it, I sit down and I start to like map it out. So I'm pretty sure, let's just look and see if we can capture some of my process here. Do, 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 do. I know I've got some infographics that I've designed in here. Do I? I thought I did. Maybe I don't. Or maybe it's going to take, oh yeah, so here's one where I was just like drawing out, um, I made a graphic called the process of coaching that we're just about to publish. I think actually it's now ready. If you want that, let me know. It's kind of cool. It's a uh, it's a 13 page little mini booklet that you can flip through, of course, and it talks about all of the um, it answers a lot of the questions that have come forward as people, you know, want to know about coaching. And on the one hand, I want to give them the experience of working with me. But on the other hand, there's sort of questions people have like. What can I expect? How long does this take? Why does it cost a bunch of money? Why does it have to be like a 12-month commitment? Um, what? How does this actually work? Like, is there some sort of system? And so I was like, great, I'm going to answer that for people because that's important. Yeah, the process of coaching. So make sure you message me or email me so that I don't forget. If you put it in the comments there, I'll, I'll, I'll lose it. So this, this is an example where I just sat down with music and then started to plan it out. Here's another one, uh, growth versus transformation. So a lot of my creative work comes not on a computer. 
once I'm in front of a computer screen, there's so much going on. I find it very distracting and I could force discipline, discipline. I could get really ah, discipline and try to make that happen. But what I notice is I just function better when I reduce the bandwidth, when I lower that stuff down, it gets easier. And then the last thing is, I guess I would say embracing boredom. So I find I naturally have a resistance to lowering my bandwidth. And what that means is if I have a couple hours on a Friday night, my natural direction will be towards a higher level of bandwidth and consumption. I'm, I'm gonna uh, watch more TV, play video games, even drinking and eating food, like oh, that's all higher bandwidth. Consider that one, right? Like richer food, and like alcohol, higher bandwidth than water and like a salad. Interesting to consider that, right? So my default is gonna to be to go to those directions. And if I'm like, I really wanna practice some creativity in this moment, then what would probably often serve me is doing something like put on music, grab my drum, and then just start to drum. I always have resistance to that. So it's worth me noting for myself, like, oh, it requires something to get over the hump. Once I do, I'm kind of in it, but it does require a bit of um, a bit of commitment to choose to like turn the bandwidth down and be with what's there. So those are some of the things that I do. Let's see what you guys had. Uh, Andrea says it's about creating a non-cognitive task that can occupy my monkey mind. For example, Andrea wanted to listen today, but my brain knows I've got work to do. So to create presence, she cleared her desk and grabbed her coloring. I'm, I'm glad you did, Andrea. And that's awesome too. That's um. One of the things that allows my creativity to really blossom and really be allow me to be really present with my clients is I often, and I enroll them this, I often go out walking while we're talking. I have a very good microphone that cuts out most of the noise and I clear like, let me know if something's in the way so that we can address that. But um, what that does is it gives my body something to do and it gets me away from distractions like a TV screen, the unfolded laundry that I need to do, the dishwasher that might need emptying, all of that stuff's gone. And then I'm in nature and my body's physically moving. And that really promotes creativity and presence for me. Um, Andrea says, I also get really creative in conversations. So I have creativity uh, partners. So that gives you some ways, David. I'd love to hear some of yours when you listen to this. What are some of the things you found in inspire your creativity? Uh, okay, I think we're gonna finish up there. Um, I'm gonna do a little plug for the Forge. I'm gonna look over here at my visual display. It looks like we've got about five spots remaining. Um, a lot of the people you see commenting uh, on the in our comments are members or have been members of the Forge. Um, it's truly remarkable, and it's it's really an opportunity to not just learn about transformation, but to learn through transformation. And what that means is, rather than learn concepts that then exist in your brain, instead you become the concepts. They become the way you live and show up in your life. And what that does is it's a lot like your leadership becomes a function. It's a lot like riding a bike. You don't have to get on a bike and figure out how, oh, I got to turn right so that I can then turn left and then blah, blah, blah. You just be riding a bike. Or to put differently, riding, riding a bike uses you. You don't use it. So that's what we're creating. That's the whole point of this structure is to support you in becoming coach and leader as ways of being and just showing up and embodying in the world. And from that, what tends to happen, yeah, you get a bunch of awesome transformation in your own life, but also the lives of the people around you transform, not because you're doing something to them, but by virtue of who you're being in itself becomes transformational. Your very presence becomes transforming. So it's a nine month program. It starts in September. If that's something that speaks to you, that's interesting to you, reach out, let's have a conversation about it. It's good stuff. And if you'd like that infographic, the process of coaching, send me a message, reach out for that too. And I'll send that to you. Um, and I'll put it up in our free resources page and all that good stuff. Okay, good chat. Good chat, everyone. I hope you have an amazing weekend. Love you all and bye for now.